evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Or is it during the Queen in the Queen Prince Anyway, uh, As Andrew said, we're going to talk about um, uh, investment philosophies and in particular our investment philosophy, and we thought it was an excellent time to do that, coming out of what has been the, the worst economic circumstances probably in our, in our lifetimes, and a good time to test whether things work or whether they don't work. Because we can theorise all day long, but until, um, until it stands the test of a of a down market, then it doesn't mean a great deal. And it's maybe a little ironic that our philosophies were born out of the 1987 stock market crash, which was about two years exactly after I became a financial planner. Um, so there was a, quite a shock to my system, I can tell you, and all and my clients. And the things that we learned out of that were that managed funds don't work in a down market, that we had to have our clients being able to control their own destiny, that is not the at the mercy of other people's actions. We had to be able to control cash flow, and we had to be in, flexible, in a flexible position so that we could take advantage of market opportunities. So those were the sort of key things that we took out of the 87 crash, and that's formulated the um, investment philosophies that we, um, that we use today. You know, there's a lot of theories that go around in investment markets, and you read about them all day long, I and mean, uh, they're probably the most theorized um, uh, industry in the world. Um, but there's a, a great deal of difference between investment theory and investment strategy. And to give you an example of that, a few years ago we, uh, we attended the Financial Planning Association conference um, where, uh, where they had a session on portfolio construction. And on the stage they had a panel consisting of expert uh, fund managers, a bond market manager, international fund, uh, equities manager, Australian equities manager, and a property trust manager. And the whole idea of this session was to present the panel and the audience, who are all financial planners, with a number of case, case studies of, 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 um, of people's situations, family situations, of uh, different types, different circumstances, different goals and objectives, and then to try and compare what the experts were saying to what the financial planners were saying. And the huge um, message that, that I got and we got out of that session was there was an absolute and total disconnect. You know, it's already well for sitting up in Collins Street managing a bond, a bond fund, but when it doesn't relate to the people whose money you're, you're managing, there's a total disconnect. And so the, the initial point that we want to make is that <coughs> if this works, if it doesn't, <laughs> is the you factor. I mean, this is all about you. It's not about some market theory. It's not about some trendy investment of today. This is about achieving your objective with your money. And so the you factor is an absolutely vital part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you had a 9 out of 10 in, um, financial planners, if you went to see them, they will give you a questionnaire and, um, and, and formulate a risk profile. So you might come out as a growth investor, you might come out as a balanced investor, you might come out as a conservative investor. And from that risk profile, they will construct a computer-driven asset allocation or mix of asset types based on risk. We absolutely reject that as being of any use whatsoever because history has shown to us that people are risk tolerant when markets are good and risk averse when markets are bad. And we've seen that in the last three years. The people in the grip of fear when the market um, starts to free fall. And again, at another conference, a CFP conference that we went to in 2001, which was just after the tech wreck, and there were literally advisors crying at this conference because they'd overweighted their clients in international market funds, which were running hot before that. Uh, and then all of a sudden there was a realisation that these technology com companies weren't actually making any money, and the market collapsed. And if you recall, you may, may not recall because our market didn't drop but the US market dropped 47%, and the English market dropped nearly 50%. So the people who were overweight in international equities lost a lot of money, and it wasn't going to come back. And so the point being that, that uh, you have to be really careful about managing these investment strategies. Warren Buffett, he's the world's most successful investor and the world's richest man. 
and uh, a lot of the philosophies that we that we espouse and that we follow are Buffett philosophy, philosophies. And so, what we aim to do, our, our view is that um, when we when we talk to you, when we talk to a new client, that we're wanting to talk talk about goals, objectives, circumstances, what you want to achieve um, out, of, out of the strategy that we formulate. And we put those, those strategies together and, and blend a mix of investment types which all have different characteristics and will, will, will achieve different things. And then it's our job to make sure that you're comfortable with the, with the amount of risk involved. And then we have to manage the risk and manage the, vol manage the volatility. And risk really is more about volatility, that's markets going up and down, than it is about losing your money. And this is where the risk and greed factor comes in. And sometimes we're going to ask you to make very difficult decisions because we're going to be looking to take profits when markets are running hot and buy into market, markets that are running badly. In other words, take profits when, when, when profits are there, buy assets that are undervalued. And this is all called rebalancing. And it's one of the key issues about, um, about um, the effectiveness of, um, of investment management. And it's one of the things we've worked really, really hard to do in the last three years. We've been working really hard to rebalance portfolios, look for opportunities. I was just talking with, uh, with Philip before about underpinning with income. Vitally important, particularly in this sort of a market. Because here we are, we're going into a, a, a declining interest rate market while we've been buying inflated dividends because of the, of the, um, of the falling in, uh, in value of shares. So therefore, our clients' portfolios are going to be strong in dividend now when interest rates are falling and income is falling. And so eventually that's going to, to, um, to um, be reflected in capital gain. So let me give you just a quick idea of what I'm talking about with rebalancing. <coughs> we take a portfolio like this one which is a million dollars, we've got 40% in Australian shares, 40% in fixed interest, 10% in property, 5 in international shares and 5 in cash. That's our, that's our model, that's, what we've, uh, that's the strategy that we've formulated for this particular client. And then we find that the Australian share sector has outperformed the rest. So we've got an overweight position in, in Australian shares, it's now gone to 46% and the rest of the portfolio is underweight. So what we have to do is take some profit out of Australian shares and redistribute it back into the other sectors which are underperforming. And what that does is lock in some profits out of another overperforming sector and allows us to increase the amount that we've got in, invested in other things, in particular fixed interest. So there's, there's, no, there's no rocket science in this theory, it's just a matter of you've got to work hard at it. So just talking about investments, individual investments. Investment 101. There's only three places you can invest your money. <coughs> Two of them is in asset, asset ownership, that's property and, and equities, or shares, or you can invest in debt. And debt is when you lend your money to somebody else for an interest rate. Anything else is just a variety of that. It's just a rehash of that. They're the only three places that you can invest your money. It really is that simple. But the, <coughs> some of the investments in those, in those areas are again going to have different characteristics and we have to be really careful about blending those to, to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve. So let's just take a look at um, those individual investments. We'll start with fixed interest. <coughs> and this is really important, a good time to be looking at fixed interest because if you had your money locked into term <coughs> deposits right now and that's where you're going to stay, you're in trouble because um, your, your income will drop by 50% in the last um, year or so, or 30, 35% in the last year or so, and it's going to continue dropping. So that's a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a strategy that just won't work. And what we try and do is have a diversification of fixed interest and variable interest um, investments. So if you have varying maturity rates, for example, um, of fixed interest so that they, blend, they, they smooth out the, uh, the investment cycles. Together with that, we have variable interest um, uh, investments such as um, uh, list of hybrids and, and the like, which will move with the 90-day bill rate. So if you get a blend of these things, it tends to smooth out the, the, the peaks and troughs in the interest rate cycle. One thing that 
issue with, with fixed interest is that you have to be very, very wary about inflation. <clears throat> because whilst if you have a, a fixed interest investment, you can invest, say, $100,000 in, in, in a term deposit for five years, and you get $100,000 back at the end. But in fact, you don't, do you? Because the price of the cost of living has gone up. So therefore, the, the, the purchasing power isn't $100,000 at all. We've just represented that in this graph that, that, that depicts the investment of $100,000 for a period of 10 years at an inflation rate of 3%. And the buying power at the end of 10 years is $76,000. It's 34% less than it was to start with. You can't live on this strategy because eventually you run out of money. So let's move on that, that there to, uh, to property. I think property, probably everybody's love child, whether it's in investment terms. Um, and property is a great investment. We love property. Um, and property, it has two characteristics. One is, is its rental return. And property, generally speaking, is valued on a multiple of its rent. But there's also the issues of supply and demand. And, and uh, uh, anybody who's uh, studying economics knows that the basis of all e economics is of supply and demand. When supply is high and demand is low, prices go up. And obviously when, when uh, supply is plentiful and demand is low, prices go down. Same happens with property. And the fact with property is that um, no one's making any more dirt. So it's a diminishing, a diminishing um, uh, commodity. So we'll see a change in character of real estate as we're seeing, for example, in Melbourne and most cities of the world, where you'll see more um, investment into high-density living. Uh, we've seen a lot of apartments built in, in Melbourne, a lot of dual occupancies, a lot of units, and that sort of thing. So it's value-adding to property. So these are all opportunities. Um, so property is a great investment, and, and, um, and we certainly advocate it. But the problem we've had in the past is, how do we get our clients into the sorts of properties that we really like to see them in? And we're talking really about probably a bit larger property, and particularly in the commercial sector, because the commercial sector, as distinct from the residential sector, has much higher returns in terms of, of rent. For example, 3% average at the moment on residential, 6.5% average on, on commercial. Um, and the tenant pays all the outgoings. And we can attest to that, can't we, Chas? We spend our entire life paying for maintenance and lifts, and, whereas residential, the, 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 uh, the owner pays for the outgoings. So we, we're really interested in getting our clients some way of, in, of investing into commercial real estate, but actually owning it. So what we've uh, we've been look, we've been grappling with this for years, and, and um, finally we've we've had discussions with um, the people from Australian Securities Limited, who uh, run a mortgage fund that a lot of uh, a lot of you who clients of ours will be invested in. Uh, and they formulated a, a property investment which is very similar in nature to that, to, that, um, to that fund. And this is the way that it works, basically. <coughs> that there's a structure overriding, and then there are sub-accounts. And each sub-account has a property in it. And then clients of ours can, can buy that property collectively as a collective ownership. And it's, 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 it's buying real, real real estate that looks like it, feels like it, acts like it. <coughs> Um, we had nothing to do with this fund ourselves. It was important for us. We don't. We 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 um, we're very um, protective about not having conflict of interest. But we do have the ability to select the properties. So the ASL will come to us with a property and say, "Is this something you'd be interested in for your clients?" And we'll say yes or no, based on the on the, on the due diligence. So that's just uh, uh, something that we'll probably be talking. Probably have been talking to some of you already. <coughs> Moving on to shares, um, I think it's fair to say that most people see shares as being a high risk investment. And it's probably because we can look at any minute of every day and see what's happening to this price. They go up and down, up and down, day to day, up and down, up and down. Um, and it tends to... Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is just pure volatility. Again, supply and demand. And there are all sorts of mechanisms in, in the market that, um, that can cause that to happen. Uh, short selling, option trading, and various other things. <coughs> there are two ways that are generally used to um, to value investors. One's technical, which is studying trend lines, basically, and the other is fundamental, which is um, looking at the intrinsic financial value of the company based on its profit and its assets, 
and its ability to generate money. We're very much of the fundamental camp uh, that uh, most of you who have been in business or in business will know that all companies are valued by their ability to make money. So we're, we're fundamentalists uh, and we're going to be looking at things like, like uh, price to earnings ratios and, and intrinsic value. Um, but it's, a, it's a matter in the share market of being unemotional. You can't, you just can't get dragged into the, to the fear and greed factor, which we've seen, and that's what it's, it's just been so blatant. I think probably the, the biggest example I can give you is what happened to our banks in 2008, 2009, because the American banking system totally collapsed virtually. The market saw our banks as being the same as an American bank. Our banks are nothing like an American bank. We don't have no recourse loans. Our banks have statutory capital requirements. They're different beasts altogether. And yet, they were harmed in value. So obviously, we took the advantage, took the opportunity at that time. We loaded into banks in 2009. They've since come back, almost doubled in value. And of course, their dividends are just sensational. And those are the sorts of things that we try and look for. Mispricing of the market uh, on quality assets. So I suppose to capitalise that, we, we call it cool logic, so that uh, we've got to keep that cool, be logical, look for the opportunities, evaluate things in the real light of day, forget about all the rubbish that's going on in the newspapers and what the commentators are saying. Um, we obviously get advice from outside, uh, but it's really a matter of looking at it from a very cool logic perspective. <coughs> what I'd like to show you now is some facts and figures on uh, on, on some investments. Actually, this is a graph depicting the last 112 year experience of the Australian stock market. The green rectangles are positive years, the red rectangles are, are negative years. So 90 years out of the last 112, the share market's been positive. So 80% of the time, the share market will return positive returns. So we need to be, we need to be mindful of, of the fact that one year in seven or something, the market's going to have a negative return. We need to look past that, take it as an opportunity, because usually it's driven by fear, not by any fundamental problem with the assets in the market. And stick to the quality assets, stick to the quality end of the market. This is a... Um, this is, uh, depicts what... If you'd invested in these companies 15 years ago, these are the returns you'd get. If I use, for example, Commonwealth Bank, you would have made 443% on your money. But what is the striking statistic is that you would now be making 54.3% in dividends per annum on what you pay for the share. So when we say um, things, um, if they sound too good, they're probably too good to be true, they probably are. Do you know about that? Over time, these things are pretty, um, pretty impressive sort of returns. And these are... It's the important, the important point being that shares are a fantastic income investment because they increase their investment, they increase their dividends ongoing, and this is the sort, these are the sorts of results that um, you can expect to achieve. Does that surprise you? <coughs> no. Yes. <laughs> this is a couple of case studies. These are actually actual clients of ours, just to um, illustrate the point about rebalancing and. <coughs> rebalancing and <coughs> managing. So this is a client that uh, first we invested in Commonwealth Bank in 1993, invested some more money in 95, 96, uh, and, and ongoing as the prices fluctuated. But I wanted to also bring your attention to this. Um, this is in, in March 2009, where we, we made another investment at, at the, the bottom of the market when the price fell down to less than half its value. Um, and the dividend on that particular investment would have been about 13.5% at the time. At the current price, and the current dividend rate, it's only 20% in a short period of time. So in this particular client's case, we've invested a total of $73,500. Its current value is $380,000. They're currently earning a dividend return of 44.6% per annum on what they've paid and a capital growth return of 416%. And this is something as, as simple and, and, and safe as a Commonwealth Bank should. 
this is another client case study uh, in a company called Computer Steel, which many of you know, my own. <coughs> we first invested in 2000, in 1998, uh, $20,000 at the price of, do of a dollar a share. By 2000, the price had gone to $8 a share. So we, we sold out and took $80,000 profit by selling half their holdings. So that they've invested 20, we've taken out 80, we've left 80 there. Then in December 2001, which was after the New York Trade Centre disaster, computer shares price got slashed because the market felt that there wasn't going to be much activity in the market. Computer shares are share registered. So we bought $20,000 worth of convertible notes so an average price of $4 a share, which then, can, then converted into shares, and then we took profits until we sold out in 2009 because we wanted to rebalance into backs. So this client's made 100, 158000 159000 in net profit. But the big point here is that, and what, what I haven't extrapolated, is that we've reinvested $200,000 into other parts of the market. So I don't know what that earning rate has been, but um, it starts to, <coughs> starts to multiply the effect. But what it also means is that we've rebalanced all, all of this profit back into other sectors of the market. So look, that's um, <clears throat> just giving you a, a bit of an overview of, of where we see it, the way we go about it. We believe absolutely that these, um, these um, philosophies have, have worked through a very difficult time. And I, and I, I, uh, I can't say to you that we didn't at times in the early days of the, of the market downturn in 2008 uh, we look at ourselves around the table and say, well, gee, we, are we really sure about what we're doing here? And you, you get gripped in this steer thing. Uh, but it's now showing great returns, and, and uh, particularly in the era of underpinning with income, which will then extrapolate into, into capital gains. <coughs>